Good morning and welcome back to the second class for Radio 2. So we'll be continuing where we left off in the previous class and that was with regards to research. Okay, So we're busy doing uh, research on a radio audience and just briefly to recap what we spoke about in the previous lecture. We looked at commercial radio stations, so listeners versus clients. Okay, So every radio station needs their listeners, but they also need advertisers okay, to make money. To understand an audience, radio stations need to do research to know to whom they are speaking. The most important aspect to bear in mind is the source of the research. All research at the end of the day is designed and directed towards a certain goal. And as a radio station, you're competing with the likes of podcasts, internet streaming, music subscription sites. Okay, so there's a lot of competition around you. And that's without mentioning things like television or series streaming services. Radio stations are under immense pressure to understand their audience in detail. Why do we need audience research? Audience research tells us who is listening and how they are listening. It's important for us not only to know how many people are tuning in and the reasons for choosing a particular radio station and the demographic profile of your audience. We mentioned there are two types of research, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative, we said, is qualitative data, type of data that describes information, so quality, and then quantitative data, something that you are able to measure, so quantity at the end of the day. Listener behavior over the last decade has changed drastically, okay? Our attention spans have reduced drastically. We, the way that we do things is no longer the same. So we used to be able to sit and simply listen to the radio with our family, okay? Today we listen to the radio while we're driving or while we're cooking, um, while we're doing other things, while we're working with it on in the background. So with the full swing of digital age, short concentration spans and multiple external stimuli are growing exponentially. So if you don't engage your listener, you're going to lose them. Because what happens if I don't like what's happening on the radio right now? We change the channel. Okay, it's as simple as that. Okay, so as mentioned, today this is the second class of researching the audience. Um, and if you want to follow along, you can open your textbook. We're busy with chapter 11 from page 410 to 425. So we went through the who is listening part. So who is listening and then RAM, radio audience measure. And then apart from that, we're going to be looking at understanding your audience and how they listen. That's in, in Valerie Geller's Beyond Powerful Radio from page 463 to 464 then up until page 473 in essence. It's very difficult to believe that millions of people can find value in listening to a single radio station together, considering that we all have individual tastes and preferences. People generally don't behave in line with strict group characteristics, but there are some common themes that appeal to all people, like we spoke about in the previous lecture, where I said um, everyone likes sleeping in clean sheets, no one likes waiting in a line. No one that I know loves traffic. Okay, I hate traffic specifically. So there are similarities. So what we said was that um, radio stations need to position themselves in the market to attract more listeners. And how do they do this? They need to generate interesting topics that will appeal to the majority of the audiences. So again, if you don't engage a listener, you will lose them. Before delving deeply into research, it might be helpful to understand how people in your audience actually take in information. There are many more demands on people's attention now that they were just a few years ago, and many more delivery systems where people can find the information and entertainment that they're looking for. So if you don't immediately engage your listeners, they're gone. They've got too many other choices for content. Your listeners are busy and they've been trained to have short attention spans. We've all been trained to have short attention spans. They are often doing more than one thing while listening. 
The trick is to break through to each listener in the way that works best for him or her, that works best for them. Teachers suggest that students absorb information in three ways. Most of us are a mix of all three of these learning styles. The first there, auditory, aka okay, hearing, then visual, so seeing, and then kinesthetic or tactile, so touching. Most of us have one way that works best for us. While radio is not necessarily educational, our primary goal is to entertain. People do come to media for news and for new information. If you want your messages to stick with the viewer or the listener, it's useful to know that we now have all the tools at our disposal to reach each type of person in the audience. With traditional radio, um, you've got this one method, and that's auditory. But with a website, with social media, with apps, You've, you're adding this visual component. And if any of these are interactive involving your listeners, you can expand further to kinesthetic or tactile people. Of course, people are individuals, not groups. We know this. Each person has their own interest, but when you hit the core of what people care about, so that's the health, the heart, um, the pocketbook, aka money and transformation, there's a commonality of human experience, okay? When it comes to transformation, um, when it comes to transformation or transformative content, transformative topics include anything that gives a listener hope for the future, that shows how someone's life can be better tomorrow than it is at the moment because of something they've heard or seen in a program. Um, the current trend of self-help, advice, rehab, or fix-it programming is, is an example of this. Research can help you find what kind of pocketbook issue might be affecting people in your audience. And if you know what your audience uh, or your listeners care about, and if you can tap into that and pay attention to it, you'll definitely get ahead. Let's look at the BRC the Broadcast Research Council of South Africa. Radio audience measurement, aka RAM, falls under the Broadcast Research Council of South Africa, so they are the ones who do the research. You get what's called RAMs and TAMs. So RAM, R-A-M, radio audience measurement, TAM, television audience measurement. Radio audience measurement is a tailor-made independent audience survey that is specifically designed for South African radio broadcasters and advertisers to utilize in their businesses. So for radio broadcasters, RAM is a useful way of understanding their audience numbers and movement, both in terms of the trends and as a benchmark against their competitors. For radio advertisers, RAM is a useful way of understanding where their target markets are most prominent and in turn, how to make the base of their radio advertising budgets, content, and messaging. In South Africa, RAM consists of two elements, okay? The first is a series of interviews, which are conducted by field workers who collect information about the composition of South African households that will form part of the RAM survey sample, interview. It's noteworthy that the RAM survey only measures the listening habits of South Africans over the age of 15 years. Okay, We don't measure listening habits of anyone under the age of 15. So then that's number one, interviews. Number two, a radio diary, which is a paper document left with each household in the survey sample for the family to complete. The diary asks that the members of the household um, fill in what radio stations they listened to for each quarter hour per week. So the BRC is responsible for administering, monitoring and compiling radio audience measurements, so RAM. It maintains a rigorous set of rules to ensure that only diaries that have been fully and accurately completed are included in the results, which they share four times per year. Each diary that is released at those times of the year contain data collected over a six-month period. The RAM survey currently consists of about 30,000 
uh, South African households that are surveyed over 50 weeks per year, so almost the whole year. These households are mapped um, across all nine South African provinces in, in rural, peri-urban and urban environments in order to ensure an accurate representation of the South African population. In addition to the households surveyed, the BRC also uses household flooding. Okay? This is a methodology used to secure listening habits from individual members of each household. So household flooding methodology used to secure listening habits from individual members of each household, which means that 30,000 households in the sample can deliver individual diaries amounting to as many as 70,000 individuals listening habits. So the method that I'm explaining to you now was the previous way that data has been collected. We recently changed companies that do our research, so I'll talk about them in a second. Data that is released is released in Feb, May, August and November, and establishment surveys are released in March and September. When COVID struck, we sat with a big crisis. They couldn't do research, okay, because no one could go out into the field, so um, interviews could not be conducted. So there was no research for almost three years. The diary methodology is used in many different markets around the world. In the USA, for example, the diary system is still used to measure listeners in smaller markets where the portable people meter, so the PPM method, is used in their larger markets. In the smaller markets, diaries are left with listeners for only limited periods. These periods are called sweep weeks. And in these weeks, the surveys um, are sent out into the field and listenership is measured. So for radio stations, having a limited period of survey means they can plan their programming strategies to coincide with these weeks. They can schedule their biggest promotions and give away their biggest prizes during these weeks to make sure they get people listening and filling out the diaries. In South Africa, however, the diaries are out in the field for 50 weeks in order to achieve more consistency and validity in survey results. So how are individuals and households selected for the research? The BRC uses an approach called probability proportionate to size, PPS. So they use PPS sampling, okay? This works by attributing numbers to the proportion, to the portion of the population that is over 15 years of age in the small areas, which effectively represents the whole population. PPS then randomly selects these numbered people living in those small areas to participate in the survey and therefore make up the sample. The small areas are cl classified by the South African Census Study, which classifies each area of the country that has a fixed boundary. Each household needs to be selected with a sample interval in mind. This means that a household that is selected for data by the field worker needs to be far enough away from other, household in, other households in the sample. The distance between sample households is based on the density of the households in that particular area, okay? So the distance between the sample households is based on the density of the households, how many houses are in that area. So in areas where there are many households, the distance will be shorter between the households. And the opposite will be true in areas where households already have larger spaces between them. Obviously, in rural areas, their houses are extremely close to each other, right? And in the higher, um, the upper end market, houses have big gardens, um, which means they are spaced quite a distance from each other. 
So there are fewer households in that same strip of area. Let's take one kilometer. There might only be, I don't know, four houses if it's in an upper area um, within that stretch versus, let's say, 20 houses in a rural area. Hence why we have sample interval. This practice exists to try and space out the area of collection so as not to select only one half of a suburb. Um, for example, which in South Africa can result in a particular in a particular demographic bias. In fact, the field worker will walk in a clockwise spiral path and count the number of houses on both sides of the street in order to reach the correct sampling interval number. So what counts as a household? Quite simply, a household is a group of people who live together sleep in the same dwelling and share meals together um, a minimum of four times a week. This can include people who live in back rooms, cottages, granny flats, uh, shacks or other separate dwellings on the same property, provided that people meet the criteria of eating together with other members of the household okay, they share the property with. The field worker will keep a roster of each household in the area that they are responsible for. They will continue to keep this roster updated to ensure that any new members entering the household and any members leaving the household through death, moving away or separation are recorded. This is to ensure that all listening habits are recorded in the household. Several members of the household will influence what stations are listened to, as well as when members of the household listen to radio. All of these details are recorded in the paper diary maintained by that household. So with regards to COVID and the BRC research, this was what was placed up on the BRC's website okay, in 2020, so quite a while ago already. So this was placed on the BRC website, just explaining that they could not do face-to-face -face field work and that they're looking at alternative solutions that they were considering. And these obviously were continued up until they found a new way of doing research, which came out in January. So prior to the report that has been released now, the last report that we had to be working with was April 2019 to March 2020 report. OK, so quite old statistics. Let's have a look at the latest stats that have been released. So if we look at these numbers, this is the latest release um, and this is for last year, April uh, to October. So April to October 2021. RAMS Amplify Radio Listenership Report. So you can see here, Ukozi FM, they have an average weekly listenership of 7.979 million. Okay. And April to October, it was 7.925 million. Okay. Metro FM 5.49. For April to August, April to October, 5.314. Mklobo Wenene, thirdly, with 4.72 um, million. And then April to October, 4.599 million. Then it's the CDFM with just over 4 mil. Motswedding with 3.5 mil. Tubela FM with 3 mil. Radio 2000, 2 million. Gagazi FM, 1.6 million. Uh, Jacaranda then with 1.4 through 8 million, then Aresthia 1.327, Equiquezi FM 1.416, Mungana Lonene 1.324 million, Iguala Guala FM 1.352 mil, East Coast Radio 1.265, Palapala 1.137, and then 947 with 1149 mil. Um, then KFM with 1.1 mil and then 5FM with just over 1 mil. Then we have nine for, uh, YFM with a mil and Heart FM under that. Okay. So this is interesting because 947 and Jacaranda was always very close to one another. Okay. In the sense of that 947 used to be the third highest 
third biggest radio station in the country uh, from a commercial point of view. So if we look here, because FM is a PBS station, okay, public broadcaster. Metro FM is a commercial radio station. Mplobo is a PBS, Lesedi is a PBS, Motswading is a PBS, Tobela is a PBS, and that's how it goes. And then Kagazi is the next commercial and then Jacaranda. Okay, so here you can see kind of what's happening at the moment with the first stats from the new company that have taken over the stat release. If we look from a community perspective, they've broken it down according to areas, but I want to show you um, how things went. Here we go. So first and foremost, Josie with um, 529,000 listeners. Then Teta FM, then Kasi, then Pretoria FM, then Moraleta Community Radio, Rainbow, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see there's a very big discrepancy be between Josie and Teta FM. So please do yourself a favor and go and have a look at the, the RAM document, okay? It's on the BRC's website. You're gonna need it for your first assessment. So you need to understand it. So make, make sure that you go through it, okay? So through SOF, we used to, um, we used to do research in terms of living standard measure, okay? So LSM. These measures divided the population in 10 LSM groups, where 10 is the highest living standard level and one was the lowest level. One of the most consistent segmentation methodologies emerging from AMPS over the years was the widely used socioeconomic segmentation tool, which was the living standards measure. Okay. LSM, living standard measure, was used in 1989 for the first time, so it's quite old. Um, and back then they used to use a list of 13 household variables ranging from things like household appliances, motor vehicle ownership, um, geolocation, and that's how they divided these. AMPS was never intended to represent an immovable fixed point, and during the 30 years of evolution, the variables used to create the primary LSM groups also underwent a consistent revision. And then in 2008, the LSM framework was changed a little bit further, and in 2013, a further subdivision of the data created 17 discernible LSM segments. And in the final AMPS database, despite the persistent reference to 10 LSMs, there were in fact 17 primary segments, which in turn needed to be clustered. So post AMPS, we've seen the development and adoption of the SEM, so socioeconomic measure, market segmentation tool. At a functional le level, SEM represents the most recent iteration of a national socioeconomic segmentation model, and it fulfills the same macro uh, segmentation function as LSM did. So let's start here at the bottom, the journey from LSM to SEM. So we had AMPS LSM, then it became ES LSM, then ES SEM. ES established survey. So differences in sampling, ES sample is representative of the South African population. The differences in how the LSM questions are asked in each questionnaire, here you can see, so AMPS here stands for All Media Products Survey. Okay, so All Media Product Survey. And here you can see how they line up against each other from the AMPS, the old way of doing it, LSM to EA's established survey, LSM way of doing it, okay? And then you get the SEM. So LSM and SEM are based on different inputs and have achieved different things. So SEM is structural heavy, LSM is durable and techno heavy and contains areas, so area weightings. Don't worry about that too much. What you can see from the breakdown though here is how LSM are broken down versus SEM. So SEM is socioeconomic measure that depicts how South Africans live based on what they have access to and near their homes, okay? It came in in 2018 
SEM is reflective of our unequal society. We know how unequal the society is, and it provides a more realistic picture of South Africa. It's relevant and differentiating, meaningfully differentiates how people live along a spectrum from low to high socioeconomic living. Um, it's more stable. A person's score doesn't change quickly over time as it focuses on structural items and infrastructure elements. And there's a low reliance on durables, like for instance, do you have a kettle or a toaster? Um, and there's no reliance on technology items. Then there's flexibility of analysis to meet target market requirements. Um, output is a continuum from zero to 100 and therefore can be sliced and diced as required. And it's a good predictor of media and purchasing behavior and highly correlated to various demographics and attitudes. Okay, so this is what the South African households look like according to the socioeconomic measurement. Um, this is called the SEM continuum. So here at the top, you can see score zero, low socioeconomic living. And at the bottom, you can see score 100, high socioeconomic living. And then on the right hand side, SEM 1 to 10, each person is given a score between zero and 100, depending on what items they have in their household and what public services they have access to. SEM distribution of the population shows a skew towards low socioeconomic living, but also is, has a good representation of the top end. So this is how they see that we as South Africa are broken down. So I'm not going to go into complete detail of all of this. Here are the 14 SEM inputs. So do you have a built-in kitchen sink, water source, aka hot running water? Um, what type of toilet do you have? Do you have a car, a microwave, washing machine, a deep freezer, which is freestanding, floor polisher or vacuum cleaner? What type of roof material do you have? What type of material is your floor made out of? How many sleeping rooms do you have? Do you have a home security system? Is there a post office near where you live? Is there a police station where you live? LSM versus SEM. So again, here you can these were all of the measurements that were looked at from an LSM perspective, so 29 of them, and then SEM. So just briefly again, what is SEM? It depicts how South Africans live based on what they have access to and near their homes. Okay. Relies less on durables, so these things. For instance, do you have a DVD player? Do you have two or more cell phones? Um, do you have a refrigerator? Do you have a home theater system, a home telephone, washing machine, electric stove, and more on household structures? So what does your house look like? Uh, do you have tile floors? Do you have tiles on your roof? That kind of stuff. And the community's infrastructure. So is there a police station near you, a school near you? Is there a post office near you? What is close to you? SEMs are an approved approach to segmentation, which is relevant to South Africa. Okay, we've gone through these 14. So the F SEM demographics include population, area, language, province, education, and work. So LSM was more of a fairy tale. This is how they saw that the country was broken down um, from a low socioeconomic living to a high socioeconomic living. And at the bottom, if we look at the SEM breakdown, that's way more reality, okay? So here you can see an actual breakdown of the socioeconomic measure. Research can also be an incredible tool for programmers and managers when working with on-air talent and salespeople. Research is a necessary tool for modern business. Can you imagine a car manufacturer putting out a new car without test marketing it first? Um, big money is at stake. People in business want data before they introduce a new product. They need a realistic sense of how the audience or consumer will react. Radio, TV, the internet, and other forms of media are no different. Many products we don't think twice about today are in our lives because of quantitative research. Single serving frozen dinners, zipper lock plastic bags, automobile cup holders, a tire patch in a can, in the United States, there are pages and pages of names of researchers in media directories. Anyone can hang out. Um, anyone can hang out a shingle and call him or herself a researcher. 
Be careful which company you choose. It's a combination of skill and personality that makes good research. If done right, research can help you get ratings and learn the habits of your audience. Some points to consider. There is no crystal ball, okay? Before you embark on an expensive research study, see who's been there before you. Perhaps the information you seek may be easily findable elsewhere without having to commission your own costly study. Check Nielsen Audio. They, may, they might have data that you can use. There may also be research you can access that's already been done by a non-competing business in your market. One radio group successfully used results from research studies done by a local insurance company, a local bank, and a supermarket corporation. Remember that while there are many research techniques, the basic process involves asking the right questions, compiling the data, analyzing and interpreting the results in a manner that properly supports business intelligence and decision-making processes. Don't get intimidated by the language of research. Be sure that you're comfortable with the logic. Okay. After all, you need to understand and have the confidence in this interpretation if you are using it to make changes to your product. Just decide before you contract with a research company why you want to invest in the study and what you want the study to reveal. Be clear. There are two kinds of research studies. Tracking studies and action studies. Okay, so tracking studies tell you how you are doing. Action studies can tell you in what direction you should go next. While the how we are doing tracking studies can show you that you're on the right track, this research is very expensive. Before you contract with a research company, it's important to know your goals. What do you want to find out? Don't let the research company take the lead. Be proactive and help create the questions. The best questions in a research study are not the ones that provide interesting information. The most effective questions in a study are the ones that lead to real knowledge and change. If a question is not critical to achieving your goals, take it out. Ask questions, understand who your listeners are, how they live, what they care about, and how they use media is crucial. It does you no good to research programming issues if you re really don't want to hear the answers, okay? Again, before you begin the research project, make sure you are prepared to make the necessary changes. If not, why go forward with the study at all? If a programming element or a personality is something that you can't or will not move or change, why bother to research it? Before you begin, Make sure that you're prepared to make the necessary changes. Make sure that you know how your staff will deal with the findings. Remember that diaries don't capture real-time listening, okay? And phantom cue is the percentage of your cue that does not mention your radio station in their diaries as they didn't remember listening to you, okay? Very important. You can have all the research results in the world but it will always come down to people. Research is only a tool. So we've spoken about RAM. Okay, so RAM, radio audience measurement. Um, South African radio listening for BRC RAM began to, to be collected in 2016. And the survey consists of two elements, as I've mentioned, the placement interview designed to collect information about the household and individuals over the age of 15 and the radio diary designed to collect radio listening for all commercial and community radio stations in South Africa for each quarter hour across a week. So from two to quarter past two, from quarter past two to half past two, half past two to quarter to three, quarter to three to three, et cetera. Okay. And the releases happened, happens four times a year based on six months of data. So I'm going to stop that here for today. In the next lesson, we will be continuing with RAM and explaining in more detail how it's put together, how it works, as well as look at the frequently asked questions um, on the BRC website. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye for now. Bye.